It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello brothers and sisters and welcome to another edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, and this, as advertised, will indeed be a revealing prophecy episode of the Remnant Report, and not only that, but I have put together a presentation for you guys with video clips from Timothy Alberino and others that will show beyond a shadow of a doubt exactly the plan that the enemy had for this country of America that the secret societies and the Luciferians of this world have for a long, long time seen as the new Atlantis. And it will absolutely play a significant role in Bible prophecy. And after we watch the video clip that is about, well, it's a video made out of clips. It's about 20 to 25 minutes long. After we watch that, then I've got a very special guest for you guys. He is no stranger to Kingdom Productions Network and the Remnant Report. Brother Gary Wayne is going to give about an hour or so, maybe a little more. It just depends on how things go. But he's going to give a presentation on not only how the new Atlantis or America will play a part in the end times, but he's going to be going in detail about the contents of his book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, because it has a tremendous amount to do with the topic that we're talking about tonight. And also because Brother Gary has a new book out, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy 2. So I want you guys to please stick around after the video from Timothy Alberino and the clips from... 
the others that are along with that because you don't want to miss Brother Gary Wayne. Okay, guys, without any further ado, here is the first part of tonight's program. Some of the information in this video is going to be quite shocking to many people, especially those of you who live in the United States. So let's begin. Manly Palmer Hall was a Canadian-born author, lecturer, astrologer, and mystic. He's best known for his 1928 work, The Secret of All Ages. Over his 70-year career, he gave thousands of lectures, including two at Carnegie Hall, and published over 150 books. In 1934, he founded the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, which he dedicated to the truth seekers of all time, with a research library, lecture hall, and publishing house. Many of his lectures can be found online, and his books are still in print. It's important to note that Manly P. Hall was, in fact, an occultist, a Freemason, and a Luciferian. We can see from his writings that he was deeply into the occult and that he promoted Luciferian doctrine and Freemasonry without any shadow of doubt. He basically promoted the deification of man, which is found in all Luciferian doctrine, hence this quotation. He spoke a lot about secrets, secret societies, secret symbols, and the secret language of symbolism, and of course Freemasonry, because he was heavily into Freemasonry. Manly P. Hall also taught that Jesus certainly was not the way, the truth, and the life. According to him, Jesus was just one of many spiritual teachers that led humans into spiritual enlightenment. This, of course, agrees with the teachings of Theosophy and Helena Blavatsky. Manny P. Hall wrote three books about America, The Secret History of America, America's Assignment with Destiny, and The Secret Destiny of America. This description says, Hall reveals how shadowy mystical orders lay behind the seemingly fortuitous birth of the United States, bringing together such forgotten fragments of history as Akhenaten's monotheism, Christopher Columbus's true identity, the London prophecy delivered the year of Washington's birth, and the mysterious stranger who swayed the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Manly P. Hall gives a surprisingly plausible account of the American nation as an occult experiment in enlightened self-government and religious liberty. In this description of the book, it says, Is America an assignment of destiny? What is the symbolism of the Great Seal of the U.S.? Who was the mysterious stranger who swayed the signers of the Declaration of Independence? According to Lord Bacon, the new Atlantis seems to have been set apart for the great experiment of enlightened self-government long before the Founding Fathers envisioned the rise of the American Republic. Investigating the often neglected fragments of history, evidence is presented indicating that the seeds of democracy were planted 1,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. In the book itself we read this. World democracy was the secret dream of the great classical philosophers. Thousands of years before Columbus, they were aware of the existence of our Western Hemisphere and selected it to be the site of the philosophic empire, i.e. the USA. The brilliant plan of the ancients has survived to our time, and it will continue to function until the great work is accomplished. The American nation desperately needs a vision of its own purpose. Further down the page, he speaks of the challenge of the leadership of the world. He says the larger problem and the great challenge is in how to set up a new order of world ethics firmly established on a foundation of democratic idealism. He speaks of international ethics and how that the world is now being conceived as one interdependent structure. Never in all of human history has a kingdom arisen with such power, wealth and influence as the United States. Within 200 years from the day of its founding, America ascended to the summit of supremacy, towering above every other nation on earth with a military armament twice that of all other nations combined and an economy that controlled the world. Was America's incredible rise to supremacy merely coincidental? Was it providential? One thing is for certain, this land of the plume serpent was chosen long ago to be the trestle board of an ancient plan. The key that unlocks the mystery of America's secret destiny is a name, Francis Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon, without a doubt, is one of the most enigmatic personalities of the modern era. Born in London at the height of the English Renaissance on the 22nd of January, 1561, Bacon would himself become a Renaissance man of the highest caliber.
Before his death on the 9th of April, 1626, this one man within 65 years would literally define the methods of modern science, as well as the parlance of modern English. But perhaps most significantly of all, he would chart the very destiny of what was to become the United States of America. Aside from his many exploits in science, philosophy, and literature, Bacon was a powerful statesman and parliamentarian, holding many titles during his illustrious career, including Attorney General, Lord Chancellor of England, Vice Count of St. Alban, and Baron of Verulam, among others. He was also a favored courtier and close advisor of both Queen Elizabeth and her successor, King James. Dubbed the father of modern science, Francis Bacon has been hailed by many, including Thomas Jefferson, as one of the most influential men in all of human history. But behind the public veneer of this brilliant man lie dark and demonic shadows. Ironically, Francis Bacon is widely considered within the academic community to be the archetype of empiricism and practical thinking. And yet, if truth be told, this father of modern science can also be rightly considered the father of modern esotericism. It was most likely Bacon who coined the phrase, knowledge is power. But what escapes those who employ this axiom is that the knowledge which Bacon valued most was not empirical knowledge, as they suppose, but rather esoteric knowledge. In other words, secret knowledge is the source of true power. It is no wonder then that Bacon himself claimed to be in possession of such secret knowledge, which he attained by his own admission through intercourse with demons. Among his many affiliations with the occult, Francis Bacon was a master Kabbalist. Kabbalah is the Jewish branch of the ancient mystery schools, and like the other branches, its prime objective is the perfection and deification of man, in a word, Luciferianism. For Bacon, the empirical material sciences were merely facilitators of the greater esoteric metaphysical sciences through which secret knowledge could be attained via contact with superior spiritual beings residing outside of the physical plane, beings through whom he claimed to have received the inspiration of his life's work. In order to veil this intercourse with demons from the vigilant eyes of the Roman Catholic Church and political adversaries, he concealed his occultic practices within the sanctum of secret societies, most notably the shadowy brotherhood of the Rose and Cross, the Rosicrucians, of whom Bacon was chief. In fact, there is reason to believe that Francis Bacon was the protege of notorious wizard Dr. John Dee, who was a close friend and advisor to Queen Elizabeth and the devisor of a new brand of sorcery he called Enochian Angel Magic. Aside from being a sorcerer, Dee was a respected mathematician and astronomer, as well as a leading expert in navigation who trained many of the explorers that would conduct England's voyages of discovery. Dee was also a prominent figure within the Order of the Rosen Cross, and was most likely the Order's Grand Master, before passing the torch to Bacon. There are many peculiar stories surrounding the lives and times of both John Dee and Francis Bacon, which are in themselves highly intriguing. But what is most relevant to this analysis was their shared conviction that the legendary empire of Atlantis would rise again in the very land that is now called the United States of America. Dee and Bacon not only shared this conviction, but also labored under the guidance of non-human intelligences to make it so. Before his death in 1626, Bacon wrote a bizarre novel entitled New Atlantis. The book would not be published until 1627 by Bacon's personal secretary, William Raleigh, and never in its entirety. The traditional story holds that Francis Bacon was unable to finish the novel before his death, but many of the initiated brethren believed differently, including Manley P. Hall. The New Atlantis was first published in 1627 as a kind of appendix to the Silva Savarum, a natural history in ten centuries. On the title page is a curious design. It shows the figure of an ancient creature representing time drawing a female figure from a dark cavern. The meaning is obvious. Through time, the hidden truth shall be revealed. This figure is one of the most famous of the seals or symbols of the Order of the Quest. Contained within it is the whole promise of the resurrection of man and the restitution of the divine theology. It is well known among the secret societies of Europe that the second part of the New Atlantis exists. 
It includes a description of the great room in Solomon's house, wherein are displayed the crests and the coats of arms of the governors of the philosophic empire. It may be for this reason that the writings were suppressed, for these crests and arms belong to real persons who might have been subjected to persecution, as Sir Walter Raleigh was, if their association with the secret order had been openly announced. The New Atlantis is a fictional narrative, but with a non-fictional plot that may have served as the codex, the very blueprint for the formulation of the government of the United States of America and the esoteric organization that would control it from behind the scenes. In many ways, the New Atlantis is a manifesto of the secret society, a public confession, though concealed in a parlance perceived only by the initiated, concerning the construction of a utopian Christian society that would be ruled by a pagan philosophic priesthood, a priesthood dedicated to the doctrine and execution of the Luciferian agenda. The following is a brief summation of the New Atlantis. The story begins with a group of seafaring Europeans who set out on a voyage from the shores of Peru, but after being swept up in wayward winds, are driven far from their intended destination to the shores of an uncharted and mysterious island whose name, they are told, is Ben Salem, or Son of Peace in Hebrew. The seafarers soon discover that Ben Salem is a utopian Christian society governed by an order of philosophic priests called the Society of Solomon's House. Which house or college, my good brethren, is the very eye I, I of sort the of team. left you with a revelation that many of you were not prepared to receive. And tonight I'm going to continue and back it up with a lot of facts. Remember, a lot of the meat of this little mini-series that we're doing this week comes from a book entitled Scarlet and the Beast, written by John Daniel. Now, it covered a lot of territory, and one of the points that I made is that the beast must resemble with at least 14 points exactly ancient Rome. So we'll begin tonight setting out some of these similarities between Rome and the United States of America. From 100 to 300 A.D., most of pagan Rome converted to Christianity. And when this nation was founded, 67% of America's population was Christian. Christians in Rome suffered severe persecution. Christians in America were fleeing European persecution. Rome, ladies and gentlemen, in its time was the melting pot of the world. And today, one of the well-known phrases is that America is the melting pot of the world. Rome was a democracy based upon a two-party system, the optimates and the populares. And the United States of America, they say, is a democracy. It was really founded as a republic, but today, a democracy based upon a two-party system, the Democrats and the Republicans. Rome had a divided balance of power, the Roman Tribune and his Senate. America has a divided balance of power, the American President and his Congress. Rome was based on specific laws. They had 12 tables. America is based on specific laws, our Constitution. Rome protected the rights of its citizens. America, up until recently, protected the rights of its citizens. In Rome, all men were equal. That was the international law of Rome. In America, all men are equal according to the Declaration of Independence. But let me set that straight. All men in the Declaration of Independence were created equal. All men are not equal. And in Rome, all men, even though they said they were equal, were not. Those are facts. Look in history and you will see. Rome had a sordid history of slavery. America also had a sordid history of slavery. Rome was capitalistic. America is capitalistic. Rome practiced abortion as a means of population control. Control. And the United States of America practices abortion as a form of birth control. Rome loved R-rated entertainment. Look at the history of Pompeii. And here in the United States of America, we protect R-rated entertainment under the First Amendment as freedom of speech. Rome had a welfare program funded by taxes. You all know that we also have a welfare budget and many take advantage of it. In fact, our welfare budget rivals our military budget. Rome had a thriving business in lawsuits. America also has a thriving business in lawsuits. Sports was Rome's pastime. And in America, football dominates fall and winter, basketball winter and spring, and baseball spring and summer. And I know some men who don't know anything more than the sports statistics for their favorite teams. And they think they're brilliant because of it. Ancient Rome's national emblem was the single-headed eagle pointing west. America's national emblem is the single-headed eagle pointing west. From 300 to 500 A.D., the Roman church was weakened spiritually because of pagan infiltration. And after 200 years, the church in America has also been weakened spiritually because of Masonic infiltration, which is nothing more than the ancient pagan religion of Babylon. So we have not only met 14, ladies and gentlemen, we've gone beyond 14, if you were counting. Most historians also attribute the name America to the explorer Amerigo Vespucci. Freemasonry, however, has a different point of view, and this will be new to most of you. 
For according to Freemasonry and author Manley Hall, a 33rd degree Freemason, the Indians in Central and South America say the name came from their gods who were peace-loving. For example, the supreme god of the Mayan culture of Central America was known as Quetzalcoatl, a light-skinned god who wore a long white robe covered with red crosses. Carved in the stones of his temples were serpents. Quetzalcoatl was known as the peace-loving serpent god. Serpent god. The same god in Peru was known as Ameru, the god of peace. He was pictured as a plumed serpent. Ameru's territory was known as Amaruka. The 1895 issue of the publication called Lucifer, a periodical published by Freemason Blavatsky's Theosophical Society, states this, quote, From the latter comes our word America. Amaruka is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. The priests of this god of peace once ruled the Americas. All the red men who have remained true to the ancient religion are still under his sway. And according to author William T. Still, Manley Hall claims that since the serpent is frequently symbolic of Lucifer, it is no exaggeration to extrapolate from this that America may well mean, quote, land of Lucifer, end quote. We already have discussed the hierarchy in Freemasonry and that they consider Lucifer to be the good, benevolent, and peace-loving God. Their philosophy is known as the Lucifer philosophy, and it goes something like this. Man was held prisoner by an unjust, vindictive, and jealous God in the Garden of Eden. He was bound in the chains of ignorance. Man was set free by Lucifer through his agent, Satan, when man was given the gift of intellect, and through the use of this intellect, man himself will become God. That is the Luciferian promise, the promise of Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now remember, these are all metaphors. I don't believe for one minute that there was a naked man and woman standing by a tree and a snake came up and talked to them. These are substitutes, symbols for something much, much deeper, much deeper. America is known as the good, benevolent, and peace-loving nation. We've also discussed the seal of the Illuminati, the unfinished pyramid. Its capstone and its all-seeing eye represents the kingdom of Lucifer. The image of this Luciferian masterpiece makes up half of the great seal of the United States of America. Just look at a $1 bill. And Ezekiel, chapter 28, verse 12, tells us that Lucifer was the epitome of beauty. America, the beautiful, may therefore be a sinister figure of speech for Lucifer, the beautiful. Freemason Manley P. Hall states that when Atlantis died, so did the ideal pattern of government. According to Hall, the League of Ten Kings is part of the secret doctrine preserved by secret societies through their oral traditions. Hall believes that when the unifying force of the Ten Kings was broken, destruction automatically followed. So complete was this destruction, he writes, that men forgot there is a better way of life and accepted the evils of war and crime and poverty as inevitable. The old Atlantis is gone, dissolved in a sea of human doubts. But the philosophical empire would come again as a democracy of wise men. This connects directly with the protocols of the wise men of Sion. Freemasonry planned long ago to philosophically raise Atlantis out of the sea, and in this new land reestablish democracy as a new world order, Novus Ordo Cyclorum. Masonic author George H. Steinmetz confirms in Freemasonry its hidden meaning that the democratic philosophy of Freemasonry has been traced back to the lost continent of Atlantis. He attempts to prove that Atlantis was a Masonic society by suggesting that the destroyed temples of Upper Egypt are all part of that Atlantean destruction. There, in Egypt, we find their ruined temples, which compared with our lodge rooms, have similar floor plans, the same dark north, and many of the same emblems. And remember, in the Lion King, to the north was darkness and desolation. Finally, Steinmetz says that one cannot understand the universality of Freemasonry without accepting the Atlantean account. Hall concurs. Masonry is a university teaching the liberal arts and sciences of the soul to all who will attend to its words. It is a shadow of the great Atlantean mystery school which stood with all its splendor in the ancient city of the Golden Gates, where now the turbulent Atlantic rolls in unbroken sweep. And I bet you wondered why they named the bridge in San Francisco the Golden Gate Bridge. Now you know. Hall suggests that the antediluvian civilization was democratic, that Freemasonry planned over three centuries ago to recreate a universal democratic society that will philosophically rise up out of the sea, and like Atlantis, join with ten kings to lead mankind in the pursuit of universal happiness. And what is the sea? Remember, the sea is the mass of humanity, great numbers of people. To rise up out of the sea is to establish through revolution. And that's coming. He says that the Christian church has delayed the search for the new Atlantis, and that's why they hate Christians, and Christians 
like Orthodox Jews and the followers of the Prophet Muhammad, are scheduled for extermination in the New World Order. And he alludes to the ancient Roman Empire as the last attempt at resurrection of the Atlantean project and states that another attempt would be made. And we can see how Freemasonry's planned resurrection of Atlantis correlates with Daniel's prophecy of a revived Roman Empire. Likewise, John's vision of the beast with ten horns, representing ten kings, is more significant in this regard, given the fact that Freemasonry calls for its one-world government to be patterned after the Atlantean League of Ten Kings. Therefore, to locate the headquarters of Freemasonry's new philosophical Atlantis, Daniel's revived Roman Empire, and John's beast, we must search for a land that meets the following requirements. One, if old Atlantis was democratic, then new Atlantis will be democratic and most likely be born of Templar French Freemasonry, the father of modern socialism. Two, John's beast and Freemasonry's philosophical Atlantis will figuratively rise up out of the sea in the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere west of the Straits of Gibraltar, where old Atlantis was alleged to have sunk and will be established through revolution from out of the masses of people. Three, if resurrected west of the Straits of Gibraltar, Daniel's revived Rome will be a new land in a new world populated from the territory of the old Roman Empire. Four, Daniel's uncivilized beast will be born in an uncivilized western land bordered by water. From Daniel's vantage point at Babylon, a land in the extreme west. Five, John's beast will eventually unite with ten kings, as did old Atlantis, or will be divided into ten regions according to the plan or the world model of the Club of Rome. And on its model, the world will also be divided into ten regions. Unlike Edgar Cayce, Manly P. Hall is not looking for ancient Atlantis to literally rise out of the sea, and neither am I, and neither should you, but I know that some of you at least have, are, and will continue to look for the sea as the literal source of the rising of a new landmass, which will be called Atlantis, and you don't understand the symbology, the metaphors, you are looking at the exoteric. Manny P. Hall, rather, looks to America as the nation that will represent philosophical Atlantis, and so do I. And through my studies, I know for a fact that this is it, for they have made the omission over and over and over again in their writing, the esoteric writings of the secret societies, all of them. In America's assignment with destiny, Manny P. Hall writes, quote, the explorers who opened the new world operated from a master plan and were agents of rediscovery rather than discoveries, end quote. And when Columbus landed upon the beach, instead of planting the flag of Spain, whom he was supposed to represent in his discovery, instead, ladies and gentlemen, this great explorer, who instead of carrying the cross of Christianity upon the sails of his ship, carried the cross the Red Cross of the Knights Templars planted a green flag with a white cross. In a second book called The Secret Destiny of America, Manly P. Hall claims that the unifying goal of ancient secret societies was to create a new Atlantis beyond the Atlantic Ocean in what is now called America. The bold resolution, he said, was that this western continent should become the site of the philosophic empire. Still explains that America, according to this great plan, was to become the first nation to begin to establish a universal democracy or world commonwealth of nations. This quest was said to be the most noble pursuit to which a man could devote himself. And ladies and gentlemen, I would have to agree with that statement if it were done honestly and openly and for the noble purpose for which they claim. But we know that it is built upon lies and deception and manipulation, and that the men bringing it about, and it is all men, they do not practice what they preach. They are liars, deceivers, and manipulators. And there is nothing noble about the goal of these scum. The first modern philosopher to promote America as the New Atlantis was Sir Francis Bacon, who lived from 1561 to 1626. He was an English lord and Zionist Rosicrucian. As an occultist well-versed in the great plan, also known as the Enterprise, Bacon concealed the secret doctrine in a novel entitled New Atlantis, in which he laid out the plan for a utopian society to be built on this newly discovered continent. Masonic authors Marie Bauer Hall and Manley P. Hall respectively say of Bacon, and I quote, Bacon is the founder of Freemasonry, the guiding light of the Rosicrucian order, the members of which kept the torch of true universal knowledge, the secret doctrine of the ages, alive during the dark night of the Middle Ages. Bacon had been initiated into the new liberalism represented throughout Europe by secret societies of intellectuals dedicated to civil and religious freedom. Later, when the moment was propitious, he threw the weight of his literary group with the English colonization plan for America, cherishing, as he did, the dream of a great commonwealth in the new Atlantis, end quote. This great plan has been perpetuated by an international group of only the highest initiates of the secret societies, as I have revealed to you over the years. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Remnant Report. I am the Remnant Warrior, 
and this is a special revealing prophecy edition of the remnant report and tonight we've got a special guest and he needs no introduction but i am going to allow him to introduce himself welcome brother Hi, my name is uh, Gary Wayne, and I've written a book called The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. It's a, it's a book that I spent 30 years in research and in writing the book. It was one of those books that um, I thought I wanted to write. I wanted to discuss and connect how this very, very strange verse and chapter in Genesis, Genesis 6, connects to so much else of the Bible and what has taken place in history. And what caught my attention was this very odd few lines in the opening to actually what is the flood narrative. And so how did that connect to the flood narrative? And that's where the sons of God went to the daughters of men and they produced Nephilim. And in some translations, like the King James Version, it actually says giants instead of Nephilim. And it also said that these Nephilim were before and after the flood. And so how did that happen if every, all, everyone was destroyed except for Noah and his family on the flood? And then all these giants pop up after the flood, names like Avites and Amites and Samsonites and Raphaites and Anakites and on and on and on. All of these giant nations that show up after the flood, what their influence was. And then connect that through how it relates to end time prophecy, because we have an end time prophecy, fallen angels and demons uh, that take place uh, in, in, the, in the last times. And there's also a very interesting prophecy and a sign of the times given by our Redeemer Jesus when he was asked about the signs of the times. And he said it would be just as it was in the days of Noah and just as in the days of Lot. So all of a sudden now we have a possibility of Nephilim or giants and fallen angels and demons being very much involved as a major sign for the end times. And also the interesting connection, what is in the Luke's version of that prophecy, what is their connection to Sodom? So I wanted to create a narrative that made some sense in my mind uh, and try and come up with a rational explanation that makes sense biblically. I decided I wanted to bring in a connection that I thought might be obvious that there were giants recorded in every other culture around the world on every continent and was that just a coincidence or was it telling the same kind of story? And as I was doing that research I came across documents and books and information about a society that everybody is familiar with called Freemasonry that actually takes their prehistory legends all the way back to the same time frame as Genesis 6 and before with another parallel account, albeit from a different belief system and a different perspective. And all of a sudden that brought the secret societies into this whole narrative that starts in prehistory, also crosses the flood. And so I wanted to connect that. So the book at some point in time went from a narrative just about Nephilim to a book about the creation and the rise of the Nephilim and their kingships alongside the mystical religions and the secret societies that rose uh, up around them, partnered with them, somehow crossed the flood, and continue to this day. We have the sons of God going to the daughters of men, creating the Nephilim, uh, which became the uh, heroes of old and men of renown. And so when we look at some original translations there, we look at the sons of God, and who were they? Um, the Nephilim, who exactly were they? And then the heroes of old and the men of renown, which is the hero, uh, is the Hebrew word gibberim. And so then we have in how people will interpret this verse, who actually are these people? And so that's the contentious issues that um, you're referring to and is argued from all different aspects. So just let me slowly walk through uh, who these 
three groups or three names of groups actually were and why it is exactly as it is written in Genesis 6. And so the sons of God, many people believe that they were just the sons of Seth. And therefore, these weren't actually giants. They were just um, another branch of people that came up that were evil. Well, that's, that's a very good interpretation because if you go into the New Testament and we talk about the sons of God, those are just human beings. Or if we talk about the children of, of, of Israel, those were just average human Israelites. So what makes the sons of God in Genesis 6 actually fallen angels? Well, the original translation is uh, Ben Aha Elohim, and that stands for the sons of God. And if we want to go for an exact Old Testament interpretation, we need to go to Job, Job, the book of Job. And in three particular verses in Job, it translates angels with an asterisk and an annotation at the bottom of the page that in ancient Hebrew, angels were the sons of God. And so if we now, if we look at the two other possible translations, the children of Israel in the Old Testament and the sons of God in the New Testament, we find that those two translations, the first one is the children of Israel, that is actually a prophecy for the end time and beyond. So that's not referring to the same sons of God that are in Genesis 6. And in the New Testament, it's a doctrine of adoption into being a sons of God. So it comes at the Pentecost, and it has no direct relationship to what's being referred to in the Old Testament, in particular Genesis 6. So I'm on pretty sound ground. I think that, although I understand the argument that people think that they were regular men, if they were just regular men marrying the daughters of regular men, they wouldn't produce giants. I mean, something would be have to be going on that is completely different, and uh, you would have to actually add to the narrative to make some sort of sense of it. And so now we move into the word Nephilim, which actually translates as the fallen ones. And so some people say that those were the, uh, the angels and not, um, and, and that the giants were actually the Gibberim, and I'll get to Gibberim next, which are the, the men of renown. Well, if we look at mythologies from around the world, and people have probably heard people like out of uh, the mythologies, like in Greek, where we have the Titans, or we have the Anunnaki in Sumerian mythology. The Titans were two different groups. One was giants and one's, one were the, the gods. And so if we look at the Anunnaki in Sumerian mythology, we have the same thing. So you have two groups. One was giants and one was gods. And so the second group, which is the offspring of the gods and human females in polytheist and uh, philosophy and, and mythology, uh, they produced earthborn gods. And we need to understand that the Nephilim were like a demigod. And they were a demigod in both the Genesis account and on all other accounts around the world. So they were part god or part fallen angel in the monotheist belief system, our belief system. And they were also part god and part uh, human in all the other belief systems. So we have something that's rather unique and it's, it's a very consistent narrative around the world. And so again, humans copulating with other humans can't produce demigods. And so when people want to confuse Nephilim, even though it's a specific separate word with the sons of God, which is one of the other arguments, they're confusing the two, even though you can have the same name, we know from translations that the sons of God were always the Bena Ha Elohim. They were not called Nephilim in the monotheist belief system. Now, many people say that the Nephilim weren't giants and supergiants. They were just Gibberim, men of renown and heroes of old. The Gibberim weren't necessarily Nephilim. They were, but they were kings and they were potentates and they were evil potentates. And so when 
Gibberim is used later in the Old Testament. We see it come up in Ezekiel when it's talking about very powerful kings, and we also see it come up when it's talking about Nimrod. And, and I do understand many people think that Nimrod was a giant, but I'll argue it was actually Gibberim, and that was the specific application for Nimrod as a hero of old. And so people's argument will be is, is yes, they were powerful kings, but, but they weren't giants. What people need to understand is the Bible is very specific in the application of, of the words and it's always 100% accurate and it is never in contradiction. So Nephilim were both giants and kings and evil potentates. So you could be a Gibram and be human and be an evil potentate, but that doesn't necessarily make you Nephilim. But the Nephilim were both. And in the old world and immediately after the flood, the Nephilim were, they usurped all of the kingships. And they controlled all the royal dynasties and they ruled over humankind. So that so we have those three entities. We have the sons of God, we have the Gibberim, and we have the Nephilim. Now if we go over to Greek mythology, people will understand if we talk about Hercules or Theseus or any of the famous titans, they might be surprised to know that when we go into the ancient annals recording these mythologies, they were also known as the men of renown and heroes of old. And again, these were giants and they were demigods and they were the sons of gods. And so I think the word, when we have a coincidence such as this that crosses over to other religions and other mythologies, and there's more of these testimonies around the world, that we need to take probably into account that when there are parallel accounts, they're telling a similar story, perhaps from a different perspective, but understand that they're telling the same story. And so when we look at these giants being the kings, we have to start looking at their dynasties and the bloodlines that descended from them that exist to this day. And also in Genesis 6, we look at the controversial statement that Nephilim were, bo were both before and after the flood. So we have to then to take into account, did angels go and copulate a second time after the flood to create giants, or did giants somehow survive the flood? And I'll take that on in the book and provide both ex explanations as possible. And I think people will be very, very surprised at the amount of evidence to support both. Now, the daughters of men would be the other component of Genesis 6, and most people assume that that's just going to be the descendants of Cain. And I bring this up, and I'll prove in the book that likely they were the descendants of Cain and that they were predisposed to create this sin, that it was the daughters of Cain that mated with the sons of angels in the sixth generation, the generation of Jared, to produce the giants. And What's important about this is, is to understand Genesis 6. We need to understand what happened immediately after and immediately before. So Genesis 6 is actually the introduction to the flood narrative. So by implication, and there is no separation from the discussion and the introduction of these giants that goes immediately into the flood narrative. So by implication, the story is likely connected, and I'll connect that in the book and, and have people understand that. But we also need to understand that there were six generations before the giants were created. And that's when we need to understand and learn about why the Bible records the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. And so Seth would be the, the lineage that Noah came from, and then Cain uh, had another whole line of of descendants that in prehistory also were recorded as kings. So we have this kingship concept, which is not a natural concept for uh, our religion or old Jewish religion, because kingship didn't happen in our religion until the time of King Saul, which was thousands of years later. So the king concept is a polytheist concept that actually started in Genesis with the Nephilim and with Cain before that. But when we start digging into the Cain sort of background and what was going on in prehistory, we start to learn about the rise of the mystical religions that 
the Nephilim imposed over the whole people of the earth. And so then we need to learn about how this mysticism arised. And that starts with the seven sacred sciences and the illicit knowledge that came from the fallen angels to the descendants of Cain. And so that's one of the big reasons why they were so predisposed to create this violation against the laws of creation where the seed or the spirit of heaven was going to be married with the flesh of the earth and create uh, gods of the earth. So one of the primary sort of doctrines of the early part of my book is, is I'm going to make a case that that is a violation against the laws of creation. Now these sciences and this additional information that came from the fallen angels developed into all of the major arts and sciences that uh, we, we know of today, but it's how far they were able to develop these sciences and how they were able to pervert that. And to secret that knowledge, they created a mystical religion. And it was a sun worship religion. And Enoch, son of Cain, uh, and not Enoch, uh, a son of or descendant of Seth, uh, we need to understand there's two Enochs in prehistory. And so Enoch, son of Cain, developed this whole knowledge base into a knowledge-based religion that people might know today as Gnosis or Gnosticism. And, and again, this is all connected. And so they secreted all of this advanced knowledge into these mystical religions, into an initiatory religion, which is where Freemasonry started. And actually Freemasonry comes from Masonry, which is the fifth science of geometry. And so when we look at the craft legends from Freemasonry, we understand they say and they recognize whether it's Tubal Cain or Cain or Enoch or any of the descendants of Cain as their patriarchs and their founders of this secret, uh, these secret societies to house this information. And they took this information to such a level that they claim that and I want to understand they claim that they created the great monuments of the world that mystifies people today monuments like Stonehenge or monuments like the pyramids this is their recollection and this is the same types of secret societies that we see today so we see this partnership that happened in the antediluvian world and for people who don't know that word that's just a a large word or technical word for before the flood and so we have this rise of, in the sixth generation, of the giants which usurp the kingships. They partner then with the mystical religions from the Cain line and the secret societies uh, to govern uh, the people, the kingships, and to build the monuments. So we have these, this, this major partnership that now becomes an answer for why is that so important in Genesis 6 leading to the flood because violence was everywhere evil was everywhere and uh, not respecting the true god of the universe and not worshiping the god was absolutely omnipresent because they implemented this belief system universally and with force and so by the time of noah only noah and his family were not perverted by this this tyranny that was going on by the Nephilim kingships and the religion that they that they had spun off. And thus came the flood. Okay, so let's now talk a little bit more about um, the religion, the sun worship, Sabaism, as some people might know of it, and, and relate that to the flood story in the religion of uh, the Nephilim and, and the people before the flood. And I think people are going to recognize that this is very, very familiar to with what actually crossed the flood as well, because again, it was the same religion. And so when we talk about the mystical religions, it is a sun worship. And in, I think in all the different mythologies that people know around the world and all the different religions around the world, it's basically a sun worship religion. And it's a pantheon of gods. And those are the two connections. And so how this connects together is, is that the fallen angels and perhaps even fallen angels mating with fallen angels to create a lower set of gods in the pantheon with the nephilim as the earthborn gods and the kingships uh, at the lower level of this pantheon is the polytheist religions and it's the same pantheon that is 
all around the world. It doesn't matter whether or not it's in Greece or it's in Central America or if it's India. It is the same religion and it is the same pantheon. And so the fallen angels make up the pantheon along with whatever they created thereafter. And so these are the same dark angels that mated with the sons or the daughters of men to create these giants. And so there's 200 of them that actually went to Mount Hermon then started the first generation of immortal giants. And so the demons that people refer to and were also part of what they call hero worship, which comes out of Greek mythology, these were the bodiless spirits of the giants. So the first generation of giants was created immortal because they had the immortal spirit of the angels, but their bodies weren't immortal. So those bodies either died out or they committed suicide to prevent the pain of the aging body, but those spirits were not permitted into heaven. And so that's the demons that Jesus talks about in the New Testament. And the crime for creating these giants were that those dark angels who I would call impassioned, um, they were locked away in the abyss. And these are the same angels in the abyss that will be released in the end time. So as a violation against the laws of creation, that was the punishment. Okay, so now we have the, the religion of Enoch, which is a, a sun-worshipping religion based in mysticism and the secret sciences and initiations and sacrifices um, and all sorts of uh, what we would look at as abominations, whether it's orgies or sexual perversion and on and on and on, was all created before the flood. And so people knew that there was a apocalypse coming and so they were forewarned by the angels the fallen angels and so they needed to find a way to protect this information and get it across the flood and that's what the sons of lamech and just so that people understand there's a lamech on the seth line and there's a lamech on the Cain line and that's where a lot of this sort of meshing together of the of the bloodlines and confusing of scripture and information as to who was who in in prehistory those sons and daughters and nama was the daughter involved they reinvigorated this religion and mysticism and in their generation which was the generation after the creation of the giants and they found a way to record the information uh, in terms of what those sciences and religions were and where Enoch had created nine vaults with like 36,525 books that were uh, hidden away. And so that was how this information crossed the flood and how the religion crossed the flood. The key thing to remember is, is this is the same polytheist religion that we have all around the world. And I think it will resonate with people just as when we look at what will resonate in those cultures is all of this sort of dragon and snake imagery. And that's because the fallen angels were seraphim angels and they had the face of a viper. And so you put wings on a translucent spirit being and you have a form of a dragon, which is also the first form in the fairy mythology because there are four fairies. And in, in their mythology, there are the, uh, the opalescent fairies that came from other planets who produced the earthborn fairies, which is the Nephilim. And then there was the demons or the demons, as they would call them. And those are the spirits uh, of the first generation of Nephilim that died out. And then you have the elemental, which is the fourth one. And there's three classes of little people where now we we could talk down the road about a connection to the alien mythology because that's directly related. And so this information crossed the flood and it turns out that a person that we just talked about before, Nimrod, partners with a fellow called Hermes at Babel. And they find this information and they resurrect it. And you get a hint of how powerful this information is at Babel when it says in that story about the Tower of Babel that now working together and speaking as one language there is nothing that is impossible for them and what they are building is they're building a ziggurat and a, a fortress very similar to what was going on in the antediluvian world they were recreating 
the same rebellion that caused the flood after the flood. But the question gets to be is, is how did the giants survive the flood or were they recreated after the flood? Because you could interpret Genesis 6 either way. So if we look at a second impassioned violation, and we already know that the, the original Nephilim or the original fallen angels were put into the abyss for, as punishment for creating the giants, then that means if there's another violation, then the next one is absolutely at a spite to recreate these, these giants, and it's certainly one possibility. There's nothing really in the Bible that says that there was a second impassioned violation, but if we go into uh, other mythologies and other religions, we do get that. So let me cover off a couple of that, and I'll cover off the other possibilities of Nephilim surviving the flood. So when we go into um, mythology as an example that people would know uh, two for sure, I think I, Greek mythology and um, Sumerian mythology. And in the Greek, not in the Greek, let's go to the Sumerian one first. The Epic of Gilgamesh is something that everybody's taught in school, and it's used as a representative argument that the Bible copied down the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh is the original text for the flood story. So they're a very similar story on the macro level, but totally different on the detail aspect of it. So when we look at Gilgamesh, here is a figure that is recorded in the book of Enoch as being before the flood and was actually aware of the flood that was coming, uh, even though he knew there was nothing that they could do to prevent it. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he is known as an Anunnaki, what we would call Nephilim from a Christian perspective that survived the flood. And he was a demigod as described in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So he was... He was part divine, part human, and he was a giant and a evil giant. And the person he tells the story to is a fellow called Anakedon. Now, Anakedon is created after the flood, and in the same manner as Gilgamesh was before the flood, and in the same manner as all giants were created around the world. And he was created as a counterbalance to prevent the evil that Gilgamesh was capable of doing and did both before and after the flood. But he becomes friends with Gilgamesh as opposed to counterbalancing and they actually partner more into evil. So this is the second character in the preamble that's introduced in the Epic of Gilgamesh and he too is a demigod created by the gods and a human female. And so they're telling a story about the flood story about depending on which language you want to uh, uh, translate it from, the two names that are most common are Apnepishtin and Zayazudra. As the king of Mesopotamia or Sumeria before the flood. And he takes, uh, he's, he's warned by the gods that there is a flood coming and to take uh, a similar type of uh, an account as in Noah to take animals on on this ark and to take many people of his family and much of his kin. So we now assume that Gilgamesh was probably akin to Zayazudra. And so he's the archetypical Anunnaki Nephilim potentate. So he's not this sort of peaceful agrarian. He's this military warrior evil potentate that we had talked about and so is this family that he takes along with him. So just in the preamble to their flood story, we're talking about giants and their account of surviving the flood. And also in there, we, with Anakedon of that creation, that also echoes a possible second violation to the laws of creation. If you look at Greek mythology, it's basically Pyrrha or Nora uh, as, the, as the wife of uh, Decalion, because in, in Norea will have several names, especially in the Gnostic religion and other mythologies, but they believe that Decalion and Pyrrha or Nora, Norea was the same as Noah. And that's the Greek translation. Well, that's not actually true. And so what we find is, is that Decalion is the son of Prometheus. And again, in the Greek mythology, Prometheus was both a god and a titan. 
And so we have uh, an interesting relationship there again. So we understand this, that um, Deucalion was either the son of a Titan Nephilim or was a Nephilim son of Prometheus the God, but either way, he's a Nephilim. And uh, in the Gnostic religion, they believe Norea is just a derivative of Nama, which was one of the descendants of Cain and daughter of Lamech that we had just talked about. So now we have uh, a combining of the story of another Nephilim survival. And when we look at all the accounts of prehistory, most of the accounts of prehistory in other religions and other mythologies are actually the survival of giants on an ark or they went to a mountain. And there are some other stories about humans, but the most of the ones that survive are the are the survival accounts of giants. And if we also look to the Gnostic religion, uh, which has a Christian sort of gloss to it, but it is distinctly polytheist and it is distinctly the old religion, they also have an account of a particular character in prehistory called Seth, but this would be Enemaca Seth, and this would be a, uh, another race of giants that was created in a cloud. So sort of a DNA manipulation as another account that would be similar to what might be happening in the alien mythology. So we do have an account of, of DNA manipulation and creating a superhuman Nephilim um, in prehistory from the Gnostic religions, just as we can look at other DNA manipulation with centaurs and other beings that just aren't around anymore and cross and particularly the crossbreeding of species and things like that and also in the gnostic religion they have a very very specific accounts and several accounts of sodom and gomorrah and that these were not cities of evil because in the polytheist belief system these were cities of light cities of knowledge and they believe that in these writings, at least it says in these writings, that there was another planting of this race, the giant race, in Sodom and in Gomorrah after the flood. So we take from that that they record uh, another violation against the laws of creation. So we have several, we have a couple different ways. We have both ways that are possible and perhaps both did happen. And if we look at the biblical account to say, is that possible at Sodom and Gomorrah that that's where the second violation occurred? It is very possible because in Genesis 14, we talk about a war of four kings against five and there's a Mesopotamian alliance that invades the Middle East. And all these nations that are listed are giant nations, whether it's the Amorites or the Amalekites or the Avites or the Amites and on and on and on and on. And there's several battles that take place. And this is at the time of Abraham and Lot. That's the invading army from Mesopotamia that Lot is taken captive of um, that we're talking about. And then shortly thereafter, Sodom is destroyed. So there's a definite connection that Nephilim were there. They were the kings of, of, of the civilizations after the flood and after Babel. And likely a large reason for... Uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and why it had descended so far down into abominations and, and evil. And so if we look again scripturally, how were giants able to survive the flood? And when we take into account that the flood story says that basically all human beings were wiped out all land creatures were wiped out so how can this be so it's either somehow they survived the flood or there was a second um, violation against the flood now i'm going to bring in something that people kind of overlook it does say in the flood story that the flood was designed to wipe out all the life forms that were created by god and so you have a possible skirting or very specific wording that that did not include beings created by fallen angels and so when you understand that fallen angels were created through the daughters of men perhaps not all of them were wiped out and perhaps the stories of prehistory are true with all of these different uh, cultures around the world recording 
that these giants actually survived the flood, either going to a mountain or into a cloud or on an ark. Okay, now let's also look at the, what I think people overlook very often is, is the table of nations in First Chronicles and in Genesis. And then the tables of nations does is it records Noah and his three sons and all of their descendants. Well, all of a sudden we have very early in Genesis, all of these nations like the Raphaites and the Anakites uh, that do not descend out of the table of nations. So again, they either survived the flood or there was another recreation. And it can be either. I, I actually, you know, at times I say it's one and sometimes I say it's the other. Actually, you know, the more I think about it and the more time goes, I think it's probably both. And there are so many nations that, that survived the, the flood, or at least somehow seemingly survived the flood because their names got to come out of nowhere. So when we look at uh, Seir in the Table of Nations, Seir's name enters as a people who the descendants of Esau, um, son of, of Isaac, uh, married into and these people come out of nowhere and these are the Amalekites and the Horites and there again is nothing recorded there in the table of nations or in the Old Testament to say how these people's how these people came about and so when we look further into the Old Testament and we talk about the Amalekites this is the beginning of another intermarriage and a hybrid population of giants being created that was totally anti uh, descendants of Isaac and Jacob. And so uh, we can also look at accounts of other peoples that aren't giants that somehow survived the flood somehow, some way, because again, their names kind of come out of nowhere and they are not part of the table of nations. And few of those ones, just to name an example, would be the Kenites and the Kenizzites. And of course, their history would say that they actually descended from Tubal Cain. And so when we talk about the Kenizzites and the, the Kenites uh, saying that they go back to uh, send back to Tubal Cain, that's why we see this sort of mythos, uh, this mythology that continues through religions and entertainment uh, of people surviving the flood and, go, and descending back to Tubal Cain. And probably the clearest one I, and most recent one was the recent movie about the flood and Noah, and where they insert Tubal Cain being on the flood uh, on the ark and surviving the flood and the Gnos that's 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 a 100 percent gnostic belief where they believe that um two of the sons for sure and in some accounts they'll say noah was was nephilim as well but uh they believe that uh, tubal cain and ham were the descendants of of tubal cain and they were not the sons of noah and so again you have to understand this is a different religion a different belief system but this belief system is everywhere and impacts all of our society so we see those belief systems inserted in very strange and odd spots all the time and when we talk about an ongoing mythos i mean i think so many people are probably familiar with the series on the history channel with ancient aliens and I watch Ancient Aliens all the time. I don't think there's a show that, that I've missed because I like the information that they bring in. I understand their perspective. Uh, I don't agree with their perspective, but what they're talking about is, is that the gods uh, of ancient prehistory were actually um, aliens and not gods. And so there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of how they're trying to explain it, except that from a biblical perspective, these aliens were the fallen angels, very advanced beings, and they're saying they just weren't quite as advanced, they're just more advanced than, than people of prehistory. So the accounts that they bring in are, are extraordinarily um, relevant and pertinent, but for a Christian, just understand it from their perspective and then relate to it as to what Scripture says. And then when we talk about this mythos, we're talking about what everybody looks at as the little little gray aliens. I think everybody recognizes that most aliens are um, these little grays. Well, when we talked about the four classes of fairies, in the in there are three subsets. And in the one subset, it's called the, sec, the, the subset of gnomes. 
uh, and goblins and sprites. And these were ugly little fairies. They weren't the pretty little ones with wings and everything that you see like in Disney and in Shakespeare and things like that. But these little ones, these they had a section called the, the, the Little Greys, the Grey Neighbors, as they were known in Scotland. And so these little goblins were identical to the descriptions of the Little Greys uh, that we know of today and in the sightings. And what's important about that is, is that these Greys had flying machines. And they're offering technology and the ability to evolve and they would kidnap people and return them they would do dna experimentation on them they were looking to create hybrids and in in my book i'll give an abduct uh, an abduction by a fairy by a gray neighbor um, that you will find absolutely amazing and if you didn't know it was an abduction by a fairy a little people you would think it was an, al an alien abduction so again, we see little people in these, these four classes of fairies. We see this all throughout history and all throughout our entertainment and all throughout mythology. And so if you go to the Ring of the Lords in Tolkien, you see these little people, a number of them, not all of them, because there's many kinds of little people. And what they're trying to tell us or what they believe is, is that many of these little people and other beings survived. And if you look at the end of Tolkien and it's sort of in Lord of the Rings, you have all of these beings going away on a boat. It's kind of has an imagery of an ark. So we, we take that probably at the time of the flood and the ark that these beings went away and that they survive today. Because what Tolkien says is this is now the age of, of humankind. And also in fairy mythology, just as in alien mythology, Many people believe that these spaceships come through portals. And in the fairy mythology, whether it's, it's a she, uh, spelled S-I-D-H-E, or a fairy mound, or as in King Arthur, the ladies of the lake, they guarded these portals to the other world. And so you see this incredible parallel of imagery and mythology with the alien mythology in just so many ways uh, to what we're talking about um, with fairies and with aliens. And of course the fairy mythology goes back to the bloodlines and the descendants of, of giants. And the Tuatha Dé Nan, which uh, are sort of the home race of the fairy race, uh, were, were Nephilim, and they were the offspring of the fairies in Ireland in the Celtic mythology. When we look at the bloodlines that survive on these kingships of Nephilim, there is a dragon bloodline, which is the male bloodline, and there is a fairy bloodline, which is the matriarchy. And both of those in both imagery and in importance in tracking the genealogy of the giants uh, is very, very important. And so that's why we see the fairy mythos and the dragon mythos, whether it's Dracula or uh, snake imagery. These are all the imagery of the kingships and the bloodlines. And when we understand that, we start to understand why all of this is kept alive in so many aspects, whether it's literature, whether it is entertainment, whether it's science fiction, and it has been that way throughout a 6,000 years because it's the imagery and the allegories of the mystical religion and the kingships and the bloodlines that have descended down through the generations. Okay, so now let's, let's start bringing this together a little bit more. And so what's what's the purpose of, of the other side or the descendants of giants and, and how and why do they want to enslave humankind? So let's again go first back to prehistory. So whether or not you're talking about the Greek uh, Titan rebellion uh, or the rebellion of the Nephilim against God, it's the same story. So in prehistory, we had the universal religion. We had giants. We had a rebellion against God. And so that brought about the first apocalypse. And in prehistory, they managed to enslave humankind. And so the creation of these giants, these snake-like beings, because they look just like uh, the seraphim angels, their fathers in the first generations, they don't look like that today. 
um, as, as a descendant or as a bloodline. Um, but what Lucifer, what Satan was trying to do was take his revenge out because all of this is connected back to the angelic rebellion. And so humankind is destined to uh, be raised higher than angels. And this is not what the rebellious angels want. So this is all part of the angelic rebellion. And so when prophecy talks about rebellion, it will come about again in the end days, just as it did in the antediluvian period where the first apocalypse came. And the second apocalypse will be by fire, not by water. And so when these forces and partnerships revived after the flood, we see the first rebellion taking place and again to to enslave humankind and bring on the universal mystical religion we see this at babel where nimrod is the antichrist figure and he usurps absolute control and usurping of power is one of the sort of common traits to uh, the antichrist and so he usurps power as king they bring in the mystical religion they force everybody to worship they develop the seven sacred sciences and they're going to rebel against God. And if humankind actually succeeds in the rebellion against God, the dark angels win. And so they need to enslave us. And so God stepped in and confused the languages so that it wouldn't happen again until the, uh, the time that's been ordained, which is, which is the end time. And so we will see another rebellion, another stand against God, just as it did as it occurred before the flood and at Babel. And so when we look shortly after the flood, these Nephilim, either from a recreation or surviving the flood, they once more usurped all of the main kingships after the flood. And so when we look at the Amalekite dynasty, the Egyptian dynasty, uh, the Sumerian or the Akkadian or the Mesopotamian dynasties, the Mitanni dynasty, the Hittite dynasties, these are all Nephilim dynasties. And these bloodlines exist today. And they exist today in the royal families. And so most of the royal families, and they have genealogies to prove it. At least that's what they say. And they also have genealogists. And Lawrence Gardner uh, has written uh, many books about it as being a royal genealogist. They have the ability to take those genealogies all the way back to the all the way back into prehistory and all the way back to the giants. And so this bloodline is existing today, and that's why I call it the, the descendants of giants or the bloodlines of the giants. And what these bloodlines are designed to do and have been designed to do all throughout history is, is to be kept pure to introduce the Antichrist. And so I will make a case in the book that the Antichrist of the end time will be a bloodline, or at least they will we'll present him as a bloodline descending down from the giants. So now we're ke connecting these ancient bloodlines to the royal families uh, around the world and some of the most powerful families in the world. And um, so a question that a lot of people will have is, is, so why aren't they giants today and why don't they have the you know the face of a, a serpent today and so there's kind of two schools of thought but i would encourage people if they if they ever get a chance to go see a king tut uh, display uh, look for a statue of akhenaten and that would be circa 1400 bc and if you look at that face you're still seeing many facial features that are uh, snake-like or vapor-like in terms of the uh, slanted eyes and the extended chin and the sloped forehead. And you can see through uh, prehistory there's a significant amount of elongated skulls and you'll see that in Egyptian history as well and even as, as late as in Akhenaten. And try and keep the bloodlines as pure as they can. They still have to bring in other bloodlines, otherwise diseases and genetic things will come in. So they'll reintroduce bloodlines from related families that may have some human uh, bloodlines, um, refreshing the bloodlines. And so there's a, there's been a sort of a long continual dilution over time, which is what most people will believe as to why they've come down to a size that uh, of a normal human. 
for the most part, and they don't have the same features as, as they did even 3,000 years ago, or maybe even 2,000 years ago. And then the other theory, which uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of, but um, if people really get in deep into the genre, there's a specific genre about the lizard people and that they have changeling qualities. Um, that's possible, I suppose. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of that particular one, but uh, there is a, a large following out there that, that uh, says that they have the ability to uh, duplicate what a human looks like and when they're in private, they look like the lizard. I think that's pure speculation. I don't think there's any, any proof of that. And just as there's a lot of talk about the bloodlines of the royals is an RH negative bloodline, and that's the uh, actual bloodline of the Nephilim. Uh, again, there's nothing to really prove that other than um, they say that they, their belief is that's the belief of uh, how the word Genesis came about. So you have the gene of Isis in Genesis. And so if you look at Isis, that was the wife of Osiris and they were, they were gods or fallen angels. And then they had um, Nephilim with the same names underneath. And so that's where they say the gene of Isis comes from Genesis. And so if you look at Isis, that was the wife of Osiris and they were, they were gods or fallen angels. And then they had um, Nephilim with the same names underneath. And so that's where they say the gene of Isis comes from. And that is still out there today. And in the end time, they're going to collect all of the people who have the gene of Isis. And those are the people that are going to rule the next world, not the average humankind. So they have no real need for, for humankind. And this this uh, has taken place and how they've affected history. But when we bring that into the modern time, we have to look to what are they doing today? Well, if we look at... Uh, the world today, it is being prepared for world government. It is being prepared for the end times. And this is all the work of the secret societies in the other religion and the, and the bloodlines of the giant. Because they want to bring about the end time. They want to bring about the Antichrist. They would prefer to do it not at the ordained time. They would prefer to do it any time other than the ordained time. But they will take the ordained time if they have to. And they will. So if we start looking at what's shaping our politics today and what's shaping the belief systems and the education systems and all the propaganda that is out there, it is all the same imagery and all of the same belief system and all of the same organizations that were, were there before. So if we go back to prehistory, we had uh, world government in their belief system that, that came out of the Atlantean mythology. And Atlantis was the helm of world government. They're trying to create the new Atlantis. You wonder why we had, we're just inundated with Atlantean mythology where uh, they were reigned over by 10 kings that were Nephilim kings in the antediluvian world. And... We're inundated with it because they want to create the new Atlantis. And those are the exact new words that they will use for the new age. And Bacon, who uh, is a very famous person from history and was a Rosicrucian and Freemasonry, um, he wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And what he's referring to is, is an age, a new golden age, where there is a world government that partners with a mystical religion and is reigned over by one leader. And that was the inspiration for the Royal Society, where all of our science has come back today. And that the Royal Society was just created as an ability to, to advance sciences and the religion and to worship and honor the great architect of the universe whom they call Lucifer. And so when we understand that all the education systems and all the... It's not surprising that we see developing today this concept of world government. It's an ancient concept. They want one government that they can rule over just as they did in antediluvian times and at Babel with one sun-worshipping Babel relationship, or as it's known in the end time, Babylon, and that they're going to have one king over there who will usurp kingship, which will be a modern Nimrod or a modern Nephilim. So they're working at bringing about world government. And if we look to Daniel and to, and to Revelations, we now find that 
the Bible prophesizes 10 world empires or 10 empires, 10 kings. This is the Atlantean mythology manifested but predicted within the Bible. And so you see, again, the same story being told, the same end game is just who's going to win. And we see world government rising not through somebody like a Stalin or a Hitler trying to march across the world and conquer the world. We see it rising as a platform that the Antichrist will just be able to take control of. And so when we look at NAFTA or the EEC or whatever these trading blocks that are rising, look not for 10 specific nations, look for 10 groups of nations, 10 spheres of influence, 10 regions that will unite and have one representative that goes and, and, and begins world government. But just as before, we have to have the universal religion, the mystical religion as part of that partnership to make all of this happen. And that's why you see this war against Christianity, why it's going out of the schools soon Everything about Christianity and the constitutions which were designed with this in mind will be used to persecute and sideline Christians because Christians and monotheists are their only stumbling blocks. And they're progressively, and I, and I use that word specifically, they are progressively working towards this through left-wing politics, which are the progressives. And they've tried to create this many, many times. And the last most recent one, and it's a perfect analogy, and I'll cover it off in the book, is, is, the, is the rise of the Third Reich. So you have an Antichrist figure, you have the mystical religion, you have the Third Reich, the thousand-year reign that they're trying to recreate. You have the slaughter of, of, of the Jewish people, and then it would have also been the Christians thereafter. Uh, it is an exact Antichrist-type prototype just as Nimrod was. So again, what was before is going to be a gain. So they work at bringing about these things through specific secret societies. And you remember talking us talking about Freemasonry and Masonry in its ancient forms. Well, Nimrod was the first founder of the Masonic um, secret societies at Babel, and he wrote the first constitution. And then it was um, revitalized and in reformatted the constitution at Heliopolis in in uh, Egypt and that same organization with many genitive organizations has uh, survived ever since and we know that today as the Rosicrucians we know that as uh, the Freemasonry uh, organizations we know that as the Illuminati and then all the different organizations that they have spun off and that would be including the Gnostic religions, which they worship at their center, which created theosophy, which also created New Age. We will will recognize these groups as groups like the Bilderbergers, that they are taking all the new money and utilizing them to influence the world and meeting in secrecy, just as the Bohemian uh, Society that meets in California is, again, about new money, not the old money, not the true bloodlines. Understand there's a hierarchy involved here. So Freemasonry has lower levels, and then at the 33rd degree, they become illuminated and become an adept. And from the Illuminati and from the enlightened people at the 33rd degree, the Illuminati drafts um, those adepts. And so that's the inner part. And then those people who have some bloodlines, some noble bloodlines, and who are able to continue to progress with enlightenment, they are drafted into the Rosicrucians. And above the Rosicrucians is the Council of 300. And the Council of 300 comes from the 13 families of the pure bloodlines. And then you go back to the 13 bloodlines. And within the upper tier group, they're going to keep three Antichrist figures ready to go at any time, raised from childhood, illuminated, in levels that a Rosicrucian of a lower level wouldn't have or Illuminati wouldn't have, but they've got an Antichrist figure ready to go all of the time. Some of the other organizations that these or that that these secret societies and families fund, people might uh, remember uh, the Skull and Bones. And so the Skull and Bones is just another one of these organizations, and what their main thing to do is is out of Yale, 
uh, in particular, they're going to draft in the pseudo blue, blue bloods from the United States. And then when they talk about pseudo blue bloods, that's again, the bloodlines, it's just not as pure as the ones that came across from Europe. But it's the American pure bloods. And of course, those families tend to intermarry. But the people being drafted into the skull and bones, they're the people going into all of these um, government organizations, or organizations to control governments. And so most of them go into what an organization called the CFR first, and that's the Council of Foreign Relations. So if you look at any political shows and interviews, they're going to bring on these advisors and people when they're talking about politics, and many of them are going to come from the CFR. This is from that organization, and it's, and it's their job to bring about world government. And there's not just the CFR that's an organization. You have the Bilderbergers, and they were doing the same thing, only from a European perspective. And that organization, their end product was the EEC. And we talked about that earlier as one of those rising empires, just as we look at NAFTA as part of uh, a North American entity that's going to form into these 10 world governments. And then there's another organization that people might be familiar with is the Trilateral Organization. And they were created for Europe, United States, and Japan, the three biggest economies in the 70s, to again find a way to bring the world together as, as one government. That's their charter. There's another interesting group, and there's many of these webs that are working. The Leviathan of this, of this organization is so immense. You, people can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. It's just everywhere. But there's a one that sort of brings us full circle is an organization called the Club of Rome. And the Club of Rome is an organization that was organized to bring about world government with, you guessed it, 10 empires, 10 blocks of countries. And they were organized in the late 60s and the early 70s. So this organization is above the Bilderbergers and is getting very close to the Council of 300 with its members. So very, very powerful. They split into several different groups. And so Freemasonry through Scotland where it originated and where some of the surviving Templars went was one aspect of it. And that was more or less the political aspect and it grew with the expansion of the British Empire and with the French Empire and so they also needed to replace the banking arm well there was a family in Germany uh, who was working for some of the the German bloodlines was brought in to to be the bankers and that was the Bauer family and then when they grew rich and powerful and became the banking arm of the agenda of these bloodlines and organizations, they moved to England, to, Un to, to London, and they felt they, they should change their name. And coincidentally, most people will be familiar with the family called the Rothschilds. That's who the Bauer family is, and they were created to fund these organizations. Then they, the Rothschilds, they drafted many families in the United States uh, and made them wealthy and they're loyal to the Rothschilds today. So if we talk about the Carnegies, or if we talk about the Warburgs, or if we talk about uh, J.P. Morgan, um, and in particular the Rockefellers, all of these families were funded by the Rothschilds, and they're totally loyal today. And these are sort of that heart of that pseudo blue blood line that goes back to the Rothschilds, who aren't as pure as the 13 families, because this was a... Uh, a less pure line that was brought in after the demise of, uh, of the Templars, but they were the banking arm. Now, the profits from the banks, let me back up a step first. Note that all the reserve banks in the world are owned by the banks. They're not government owned and the Rothschilds own most of the banks and the rest of the banks that are the ownership of the reserve banks were funded and created by the Rothschilds to act as their stable agents. Now, the profits that the banking industry makes, not in all countries, but particularly in the U.S., they can move their profits to trusts and not be taxed on it. And so you'll have the Rockefeller Trust and the Morgan Trust, and there's, there's just a incredible amount of these trusts. These trust organizations are used to sponsor uh, their concepts, their agenda, their ideas, bring about 
uh, the acceptability of world government to affect policy and teaching in schools, um, whatever they want on the agenda, that's what they're funded to do. And we see that happen throughout our universities, throughout our schools today, throughout what happens in the media, it's all working from this, this tax-free money coming from the banks. Look in behind uh, any organization, just look at the, the, the symbology. So if you've got anything that has a, let's say for an example, um, derivative of Lucifer, um, whether it's uh, Lucent or anything like that, and there used to be a company called Lucent Technologies uh, that had the Red Dragon as their, um, their icon and uh, their address was 666 on a street in New York. So they are very arrogant, in, but people don't look. But you have to understand the language that they're talking about. And so what they're, what they're really trying to do is just sort of get people used to the concepts so that this isn't such a big surprise. So that when world government comes about, you're ready for it when socialism and they want to create a socialist government you're used to it because you've seen these ideologies all throughout that christianity isn't a religion that you can trust in that the new testament isn't accurate the old testament isn't accurate. These, these are all the document of uh, the doctrines of what they're trying to do and when you see the imageries whether it's um with the alien myth mythos look for the religion that's in the alien mythos it's mysticism it's eastern mysticism if it's evolution being taught in school understand that comes out of eastern mysticism it's a mystical concept it's not about um that you just live and die it's that is that it's part of recreation that your your spirit will evolve over time to become a god so it's a different spin, a different belief system into godhood, just as Eden, the, the big doctrine out of Eden is, is eat from the tree of good and evil so you can be like God. The whole doctrine is, is that they're going to try and deceive us into that we believe that we can rebel against what they would call the evil God and follow the good God, which they believe is Lucifer.